I'm Benjamin Peterson. Okay, if you can spell it. B E A B E D E R S O N. Better. Sometimes it's called Betterson. Yeah, uh, prefer to say uh, Peterson. But I say Peterson. Some of my kids say Betterson. And what was your birth date? I was born November fifteenth, nineteen twenty-one. I'm about to about to have my ninetieth birthday next month. Oh my goodness, you are <laughs> phenomenal. Well, this man looks like he's 65. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> like I like to say I'm, I'm on a plateau. You're on a plateau. But, yeah, but you know what, what a plateau is? A plateau is a flat surface, but it has precipices on all sides. <laughs> so I got to stay away from the precipices. That that's part of my job. So far. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We'll go back. L like Los Alamos, <laughs> that, a perfect plateau. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you tell us about something about your background, where you're born, education? Uh, my parents are Russian Jewish immigrants who came to America. Uh, one just before World War One, and one just after World War One. They met at at a. Uh, uh, at night school, very romantic setting. They met at night school, and they lived in the Lower East Side. They were very poor, and my my father worked as a restaurant worker all of his life. Uh, and we, I grew up mainly in the Bronx, and partly in Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. Uh, and my, I would say, the great. One of the great things about New York uh, is the fact that it had City College. And City College was, just as with many other people, was a defining event in my, in my life because it gave me a completely free education in exactly the subject that I wanted, which was physics. So that's ba basically uh, my early background. Um, we were raised, of n not insignificant, we were raised in a, in a my, my parents were uh, um, leftists, as were most everybody I knew in the Bronx. Uh, we lived in a, in a sort of a, almost a communist neighborhood. I was brought up in, in my early days as a, as a young pioneer of America, which was a, a, a communist equivalent of the Boy Scouts. Um, so until until I w w was in city college for a year or two, I would say that I was pretty radical. Uh, it slowly changed. My radicalism slowly changed. I became much more interested in science and physics. I gradually lost the complete interest in, in being radical and f ended up being hostile to the whole idea by the time I had left city college. Uh, which was fortunate because otherwise I never would have lasted at Los Alamos. Um, uh, after the uh, uh, after uh, I, I after two and a half years at, at City College, I, I started decided to take a job for the Signal Corps. I moved to Philadelphia, from which from where I was drafted in 1942, and uh, uh, for the next year and a half or so, I moved around. Uh, I had almost no basic training, was shipped immediately to radio school uh, to become a tail gunner and a B-17. That was the intent, my, the intent of my, of my uh, uh, Army career. Uh, a tail gunner and a B-17, not a very life, long life expectant job in the Air Force. but. <clears throat> I had also become a radio operator. I went to radio operator school in Chicago, but they kept me there as an instructor. Uh, and from there, I, I went to a, a, a new Army program called Army Specialized Training Program. I took a course in electrical engineering uh, at Ohio State University. Uh, in, in late 1943, uh, 
w w during the Battle of the Bulge, and fighting was fierce in Europe, the army decided to give up on educating its, its uh, draftees and, to, and shipping them off to battle, to combat. Once again, I, I, by accident, there was a, um, an interviewing board came to Ohio State my commanding officer told me it was for something called the Manhattan Project and said, knowing that I loved New York, uh, said, here's a good opportunity for you to get back to New York. I grabbed the opportunity, was interviewed. They asked me some strange questions about science and, and my career. And the next thing I knew, I was on a, I was on a, on a train uh, going to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, from which I, I went, from which I uh, shipped nearby to uh, a town called Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and that's how I got into the uh, uh, Manhattan Project. That's great. Aren't you glad you weren't a tail gunner? Yes, I was supposed to be a tail gunner, and my, the, my friends who uh, went with me to radio school ended up as tail gunners. Did they survive the war? Some did, and some didn't. You look through, does that lamp? Um, at problems? some points, not like right now it does. See, if you look now. Yeah, but you look more. If you look I, where should I look? Over there? Yeah, yeah. look at me. Yeah, usually, okay. I mean, it's not that, the, it's not as big as Anne's was, so okay. it's, it's very minimal. Okay. Good. Oh, that is great. All right. So, um, what was the special engineering detachment? The special engineering detachment, uh, the, the, it was already clear that a major effort was going to be made to develop the atomic bomb. And they, they had, by, by that time, 1942, 1943, already many famous scientists were being assembled at Los Alamos uh, and elsewhere. And, and lo and behold, they discovered, just like physics professors in, at university discover, you can't do anything without assistance. So, uh, they realized that, that they needed a, a, an infrastructure of machinists and engineers and young uh, budding scientists to, to assist in the development of the bomb. And so they developed something called a special engineering detachment. And they went around the country interviewing people who they thought might fit into the project. And sure enough, at, uh, at Los Alamos, there were many, many hundreds, almost a thousand uh, SEDs eventually ended up there. Some of them, like me, uh, what you might call uh, budding graduate students, even though I had only had two and a half years of college at the time. And many also others were machinists and engineers. Uh, so the SED, uh, among other things, became a breeding ground. Uh, I guess historians of, of the world, war maybe don't understand as much as they should that this was a breeding ground for many physicists and, and chemists and other scientists who, after the war, went on to have great careers in science, partly because of the start they got in the Manhattan Project. And that was a really a, a, a unintended consequence of the Manhattan Project. I'm an example, uh, although of course I wanted to be a physicist before I got into the Manhattan Project, the experience I got at Los Alamos was invaluable in helping me build a career. That's great. Very good. Um, I know people are going to want to know about your career. Which, but we probably should go, should we go through those, the experience and then we can get to the career, whatever, order. Okay. So, um, tell us about Oak Ridge. What? Well, uh, when, when I uh, ended, got to Oak Ridge, the first thing I noticed was that my feet were, were almost ankle deep in mud. Uh, it, it was a muddy place. And the mud was, it had this characteristic orange red color that you really you really knew you were you were somewhere in the mountains in Tennessee. Now, Oak Ridge was a, a it was really thriving. There were there were construction machines everywhere. There was activity everywhere. Uh, it was there was clearly something going on. And as I say in my in my memoir, the most interesting things that I saw were these huge buildings with, with uh, towers 
with towers in, uh, and that looked just like distillation plants. And um, they were all over the place. And my first impression of them was that the distilling, uh, the distilling uh, uh, sour mash whiskey to drop on the Germans and get them, get them to, to disable them. That, then I realized that was that that was probably couldn't possibly be true. And it was only, of course, many many months later that I found out that the real purpose of the distillation plants was to distill U-235 uh, from from the uh, the principal isotope of uranium U-238. Uh, we we. Uh, were housed in barracks, of course, like soldiers always are. Uh, but the barracks were cleaned by by local y young girls. So again, the, it, it was very clear to me that this was something going on that was very unusual. But of course, we had no idea what it was. And also, some of the my the buddies that I that I uh, showed up with me, they they were all science majors from various colleges all, all over the country. So it had something to do with science, that was clear. But what it was, of course, I had no idea. No, I did not know. Would you like a drink? Um, no. Like some water? Okay. That's great. Um, so what, what were they doing? What were you doing at Oak Ridge? I was taking tests. My, when, what they did to us was to give us tests. Could you start again and say at Oak Ridge I was there? At Oak Ridge, yes. At Oak Ridge, we were given tests. We, I was there for about a week. And they were, they were, they were trying to find out where, where I would fit in the Manhattan Project. Some of the people, uh, uh, particularly the chemists, stayed in, uh, stayed in Oak Ridge. The physics types tended to go to Los Alamos. So what, what happened was I finally got shipping orders to go to Los Alamos. Uh, along with several of my of my friends who were who were also physics majors, uh, so we we just traveled as civilian in, in civilian trains, which was the first time I had used a civilian train uh, uh, since I was in the army, and and um, uh, ended up in uh, Lamy, New Mexico, which is the place where people go to when they want to get to Santa Fe. So describe Lamy. Lamy was just a, a junction, as, as far as I could tell. It was it was on the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. The, the, uh, even though apparently the train never never gets to Santa, even today doesn't get to Santa Fe. Uh, it was it was a, simply a junction on the train on, on the uh, on the railroad line. Uh, it was a one horse town. That's it. Now, I was met there by a, uh, a, an army sedan uh, driven by a whack, a, a lady soldier, who drove me to, to uh, Santa Fe, drove me to, to the uh, central square in Santa Fe, in the plaza, and uh, let me off in front of this famous, uh, uh, bil famous uh, building 109. Uh, uh, and we are, we, it was just a storefront. And I went in and I, with my papers, and I handed it to a lady. And I said, here I am. <laughs> and I guess that's the same as what happened to everybody who came to Los Alamos. Um, I handed, she looked at, she looked at them, she said, fine. She said, sit here, sit down, You'll, we'll, we'll be with you in a little while. I waited for about a half an hour, and, uh, and, uh, and just sitting in the storefront. And uh, chatted with with this lady. Turned out to be Dorothy Darth McKenna, uh, Dorothy McKenna, and uh, McKibben. McKibben, yes, Dorothy why McKibben. Why would you start? The lady turned out to be Dorothy McKibben. Yeah. So I so the, the lady the lady I spoke to with Dorothy McKibben, and uh, she was very nice and tried to make me feel comfortable. Uh, I, I, of course, had no clue of what was going on. I had no clue of where I was going to end up. Um, but she, she just chatted, made me feel comfortable, and finally gave, introduced me to a whack. Uh, and we got into a car. I, 
I believe, I can't really remember exactly, but I believe that I was the only one in the car besides the driver. This was another one of these, these olive drab army, army sedans. So that was my experience uh, at, at, in Santa Fe. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, later on, I, I found out that this is exactly the place where all of the famous physicists and scientists came and were greeted the same way by Dorothy McKibben and, uh, and ended up at Los Alamos the same way I did. But uh, I probably was the, was the lowest ranking scientist in the entire project. <laughs> But I was treated pretty well, nevertheless. <laughs> Can we try taking this off? Yeah. Are you, are you monitoring how, how it looks? Oh. Oh, no, yeah. We need to have plunging you into the darkness. Yeah. I'm just going to put a little bit less in. Okay. Yeah. yeah, just so it doesn't. Yeah. But, okay. You can see the reflection is exactly what you see. In I, see. I, I should say that, that it got pretty scary. Um, because after we drove for a while, uh, we started driving up the side of a cliff. And it was just a road with no, gu with no guardrails. And um, we, kept, we drove along this cliff uh, up and up and up until finally we reached the plateau, which, which, which was the, the, the mesa in which Los Alamos was, was planted. Uh, but it was pretty scary. But we finally got there. <coughs> and um, passed a, a bunch of guards. And uh, I reported to somebody, I don't even remember, I don't remember to whom I reported, but they shipped me into it. They, they sent me to a barracks and I put my gear in the barracks and uh, uh, went to, I believe I went to sleep. Tell us about your roommates. Who else do you recall living in the barracks with you? Yes, uh, the, the the barracks was a, a, ver, a very typical army barracks. Uh, I said that in my memoir that there were fifty kids in it, fifty uh, soldiers. I think Val Fitch said there were sixty, and we don't. I'm not sure who was right, but there, I do know that there were three three coal stoves in it. Uh, strategically uh, placed in the barracks to keep us from freezing. We, the, 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 the beds were double bunks lined, lined in, in a row, in two rows actually, with the, the, uh, the coal stoves in between. So there, must, there may, may have been 15 uh, bunks on each side. Um, and I um, uh, took a bunk uh, uh, just at random and stayed there for a couple of days and t until finally uh, somebody uh, came up to me and introduced himself as a friend of a friend. That was William Spindell. And um, uh, he was from Brooklyn and uh, he had a similar background to mine and knew some f f people I knew, uh, so we decided to become bunkmates. And so um, uh, we shared a double bunk uh, for the entire time I was at Los Alamos, almost uh, two years. Um, I, I don't know exactly why, but I got the bottom bunk. I can't remember. That, that was considered to be quite a coup to get the bottom bunk. Um, and ne next to us, there were also two New Yorkers, and that was that, since were, the soldiers were from all over the country, it was very uh, uh, in, enjoyable to have New Yorkers next to us. Uh, one was a machinist. No, in fact, they were both machinists. Um, and th they came from the Lower East Side. Uh, it turned out later that one of them happened to, <laughs> happened to be David Greenglass. So, so we were, he was in the lower bunk too. So we, we were next to each other <laughs> in, this, in this barracks and in, 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 in lower bunks. Uh, 
Uh, and then throughout the barracks were many of my friends. There was uh, Norman Greenspan, who became a very good friend of mine, a, a mathematician uh, who trained me mathematics at Brooklyn College. Unfortunately, he died recently. Uh, later, there was Richard Bellman, if, who became a famous mathematician and, and system anal analyst working for the Rand Corporation. Uh, he's a legend there now. He also died uh, some years ago. There was Peter Lax, who became a uh, very highly distinguished mathematician uh, working at the Koran Institute in New York. There was Murray Peshkin, who ended up at the Argonne. Uh, Val Fitch, who, uh, who won a Nobel Prize. Uh, so uh, these were all my buddies in the, in the army. Some buddies, really strange set of buddies. There was, oh, I, I should mention one person who in particular who I became very good friends with. That was Richard Davison. Richard Davison was unique in, in, at Los Alamos. I'm, I'm sure unique in the world. He became a legend when he ended up at the University of Washington. He became famous at, 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 after the war at the University of Washington because he never finished his PhD, as far as I know. But, but nevertheless, he was an invaluable member of the physics department because he was so smart. He happened to be the son of, of Davison of, of Davison Germa fame, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the, the, uh, the wave-like nature of the electron. So he was the son of a Nobel Prize winner. He and I spent a lot of our time trying to avoid army duties and saluting. Uh, saluting, we hated saluting. I mean, it didn't make any sense. Now, here we were uh, working on this, this this fantastic project. We still had a salute. We still ha had to uh, form and go in formation. We still had to, had to undergo uh, Saturday morning inspection, things of that sort. His, his way of dealing with it was uh, he made his bed, and he never, he never slept in it. He slept on top of his bed for the entire two years that he was at Los Alamos. He was, he was able to, to, be, to brag that he had never made his bed in the Army. Now, uh, anyway, uh, Dick Davison, unfortunately, also passed away. Uh, was, was an unusually brilliant uh, special guy, a friend of mine. Um, of course, people like that I never would have met in the regular army if I had ended up as a tail gunner. Um, let's see. Now, I haven't talked about my work yet. No. Uh, well, shortly after I arrived there, um, they, they assigned me to a project. The, pro the project was called Jumbo. Uh, I found it, it was a huge container, steel container, uh, huge in, in size, and I, I don't know, 15 or 20 feet high, maybe 8 or 10 feet in diameter. And I, and I was assigned a science. SEDs always had senior uh, scientists, that is, the, the science SEDs always was assigned to some project, and there were, of course, always very senior physicists and, and chemists uh, who they worked with. The particular person I was assigned to was Philip B. Moon, who, who was a, um, uh, from, he was, he was British. Um, and um, he had apparently arrived at Los Alamos at almost the same time I did, so we came there together. His assignment, his assignment, and therefore my assignment, was, was to study the, the, uh, the ability of, of Jumbo to, to contain a uh, abortive atomic bomb. If the atomic bomb did not actually work properly, the radioactive material would have spilled all over the landscape. There would have been a, would have been a disaster of enormous proportions. So the idea was to, to put the, the bomb inside this container. If it, if, if it, if it fizzled, then the container would hold it and keep it from spreading around the, and then destroying Los Alamos. 
essentially. If it, if it worked, then it didn't matter, because it would vaporize the, the container. So that was what was called jumbo. Uh, our job, he had had some, uh, uh, some experience. He, I should say a few words about the British. The British, of course, were also working on an atomic bomb. Sometime in, in late 1942, their project, which was called the Maud Project, I'm sure you know about it, the Maud Project, um, by arrangement uh, through Winston Churchill, decided to, uh, to, jo to join forces with the Americans. So the British were shipped to Los Alamos as a, as a group. There were maybe six or eight of the famous of, of scientists. There were all of the, f the famous, the most famous physicists in, in, in England at the time, including Oliphant. Uh, uh, and let me, I have a list here, just a minute. Let me read them for you. Um, George Thompson, um, Marcus Oliphant, James Chadwick, uh, John Cockcroft, Philip Moon, and P.B. Blackett. Uh, now, it turned out P.B. Moon, I, 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 I was slightly mistaken in my memoir, P.B. Moon was a student of Rutherford's, not Chadwick's. He, he did his, his, his work uh, at, at the Cavendish Lab at Cambridge, worked with, with um, uh, uh, Rutherford, and then ended up at Birmingham with um, Marcus Oliphant, who's another nuclear physicist. So, so he, he was, on the, was part of this Maud group, and he was assigned Jumbo too, just like I was. But I worked for him. So, so, my, at that, so I started my actual research. My research consisted of, of uh, blowing up containers <laughs> to see to see wh wh how how strong they were that was so so i became an expert in explosives uh, for two reasons i didn't we didn't do the work actually on on the los alamos mesa that was the first reason was they didn't want us blowing up anything at uh, at los alamos because because it was pretty dangerous but the um, uh, the second reason was was that that they they it was too disruptive. That there were too many w wires and pulses and and electrical sparks all over the place. So we we was we were really destroying some delicate uh, work going on at Los Alamos. So they put us away on a, on a second mesa called Two Mile Mesa. So um, so I worked at Two Mile Mesa with Philip Moon and with another one, one or two other SEDs blowing up things. Um, we used what are called strain gauges to, to, to uh, study the actual distortion of the metal by the explosives. We would install, uh, install, install small explosives inside small containers, put uh, strain gauges on the outside of the containers, blow them up, and um, a measure, measure the distortion of the steel by the explosions. Uh, I didn't, I, I, I wasn't given the job of actually deciding how strong these were. I assumed that Philip Moon was doing that. I was giving him the data. So I, so I was basically his hands, along with another f uh, friend, of, another SED, who incidentally actually did have an accident uh, right next to me, and he blew up one of these explosive caps uh, by accident, and he was, he was badly damn injured by that, but, but he recovered. Uh, so we worked, we worked on, on that. Now, I, I, I should have mentioned that, that I, I wasn't allowed to work in, 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 the, in the main part of, the, of Los Alamos called the tech area because I hadn't been cleared yet. Uh, so I was given a, sort of a second second class clearance, uh, tentative badge called the blue badge. That I did not know at the time that they were investigating me back in New York. Well, they went through this this is a series of this um, clearance in New York City. 
I apparently I passed uh, and uh, was given a white badge, which was uh, a, an entree into the actual technical area at Los Alamos where all of the important work was going on. So, it, so at that point, that was two or three months after I started on Jumbo, I uh, got the white badge. And just at that time, they decided to forget about Jumbo because they, by that time, they, their confidence was such that they, they, they were pretty sure that the bomb would work, and they decided that Jumbo was a waste of time. Now, perhaps you know Cindy Kelly right here. Is, Kelly, is, the uh, Jumbo is still there somewhere, isn't it? It's still there, right? It's at the Trinity site. It's at Trinity. It's right at Trinity. So that, so that. Uh, they're going to keep it there? Yes. Yeah? You can walk in. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been inside? Yes. Yes? Yeah. That's wonderful. Of course, I never, I never actually saw it there. I saw pictures of it. All I know is I was, when I was, I was blowing up little models of it this big. So that's the end of my jumbo adventure. That's interesting, because we found out on uh, I, I, we must have been on a two-mile mesa. We found little tiny jumbos. <laughs> and we wondered what they were. That was me. Now we know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can have an artifact. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So well, both Moon and I were reassigned. So I, that, I didn't, although I, I must say, uh, however, we remained good friends. I loved Philip Moon. He was an enor enormously entertaining person, very highly cultured, uh, very British, um, had, a, had a, uh, a very British wife. The two of them were, were just like out of, out of uh, the uh, Arthur, B Arthur, Crank, uh, Arthur Rank movies that I used to watch all the time. I really loved them very much. There were, the, the, and uh, we, we remained actually we remained in touch for for a number of years after the war. Let's see. So after uh, um, worked with him, let's see. What maybe you can tell us about the Mushroom Society? Oh, that was a little later. Oh, okay. So well, then, what was next? What was next was I got a new assignment. The new assignment. I met my my boss, my new boss. Donald Hornig, Hornig, H-O-R-N-I-G. Donald Hornig is a famous professor. I think he's still alive. Uh, he's, of course, he's hitting 100, almost hitting 100. But no, no, he was, he was only a few, maybe two years older than me. So he's still in his in mid-90s. He's in his 90s now. He's a professor of chemistry, or was a professor of chemistry at Princeton University. Um, after the after long after the war, he became a science advisor to Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, when when I knew him, uh, he his assignment at Los Alamos was to was to design the uh, ignition switches, which 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 operated the the uh, explosive explosives, which in turn operated the explosive lenses, which cause an implosion. So you have, you have switches, you have the, 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 the uh, igniters on top of the, of the cones of, implosion, of, 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 of the explosive lenses, and then you have the implosion. So our job was at the beginning to get switches. Now, the important thing to notice is, is to note is that the, the bomb consisted of a spherical and the whole purpose of, of, of the implosion was to compress the, the plutonium, the, the plutonium metal, uh, so that its density be, be, causes it to become critical and to cause a nuclear, to cause a nucle a nuclear uh, chain reaction. Uh, in order to cause this explosion, to, to cause an implosion, you need to have the the entire sphere comp compress at the same time. If if like say the left side explodes before the right side, then you'll get a jet, a jet and a stream and it'll, and it'll abort. 
So you need to know that that the the these lenses ex ignited at precisely the same time. There were 32 such lenses around around the the uh, sphere around the sphere. Each of these 32 lenses had an explosive igni igniter on the top, and then there were 32 switches somewhere else. The 32 switches were, was that was what Hornig and Dud did. Uh, and that what I was supposed to help him with. To get these 32 switches to, to ignite at precisely the same time. Well, that's, that's not, a, not a trivial thing to do. The, the timing, uh, the, the re requirements on timing were microseconds. That is to say, you, you need, these switches needed to, to, up to, to close within a, a, a few microseconds of each other. Um, in, in 1944, when I was doing this, a microsecond was a very short time. It's not a short time anymore. Everybody who uses computers, they, they, work, at, they work in much shorter times these days. Uh, but it, but in, 19, in those days, a microsecond was a, was a very short time. And, and so we had to develop the switches, and then we had to test them to make, to make sure that they were igniting within a few microseconds of each other. So that's what we did. Uh, we had a laboratory. Um, we had a, uh, we had, we had, we, we, uh, we didn't have the switches because the, the switches hadn't been designed yet, but we had to devise the testing system so that we could test the switches when they were designed. Um, so, so that was, Hornig, Hornig that what, what he did was he, he figured out how to test these, these switches to within a microsecond of each other. Uh, he, now, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that I got this exactly right, but I think that, it, that what, what, I, what, what he did was he remembered that uh, Michelson at Caltech had a, a streak camera. Uh, to, me to measure the speed of light. And that was a pretty good, I, good way to start because we know the speed of light is, is very f high. And therefore, you're doing, if you're making measurements, the measurements of the speed of light have to be precise within a very short time. So he got that, he actually got that camera or something like that. I think it was the same camera. He got it and brought it to Los Alamos and he gave it to me. And he said, here's your camera. <laughs> Go do it. So, so um, uh, the camera was, it was a very simply, conceptually very simple. It was just a, a, a rotating six-sided mirror, uh, which was rotated by a stream of air uh, spray going on it with the propellers. It went very fast. And light would come in on the mirrors, and, and the light would be scattered by the mirrors along an arc like this. And then there would be a film that was uh, maybe five feet in length that would be stretched along this, this circle. Uh, and then the, the signal from the light would hit somewhere. You wouldn't know where, but, the, but one, of the, one of the sides of the mirror would, would surely hit one of the, would hit the the um, uh, film somewhere along its, the five feet of length. So what we would do is we would line up. I'll tell, I'll tell you about the switches in a minute. We'd line up eight switches. We would ignite them. The, the light from the sparks would hit the, a, a bunch of lenses, would go to the camera. The spinning wheel would, would scatter the light around around the, the film. And then I would take the film, go to the dark room, develop it, and look and see how simultaneous the eight sparks were of, 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 the, of these switches. The sparks, that was interesting. Uh, the sparks that were developed by, by uh, uh, I forget exactly whom it was, me. It was with um, Margaret Ramsey, my, my, my coworker. Uh, in the, at the laboratory back, back, back in, in the lab. Uh, it was just simply two pins, two regular ordinary pins like this, and the spark would go between the pins, that's all. And it was just a mock-up for the, for, for the real switches that would occur, occur later. 
Uh, so, so that was my job. My job was to to put in all the wiring and to to get the to, to get, expose the film, and then to run to the dark room, to develop the dark room, and then I would show I would show the the final result to D Donald Horning, and he would decide uh, how good these these switches were. Uh, how good, how good the the the, the switches would be, uh, and and uh, uh, then make make recommendations from that. So that was my job. Uh, it was an interesting job. It involved a lot of physics, and for a two and a half year, kid with only two and a half years of college, I was really thrilled with the idea of being able. I was working in a laboratory doing real science. It was really a wonderful experience. Interesting. Wow. Can you talk about, since there aren't that many women scientists, can you to, uh, give us a little introduction to Margaret? Well, Margaret Ramsey was, was a, um, a, a chemist. She had her degree. She, was a, she, she had a bachelor's degree from chemistry from Boston. I forget what college, but, but she's from Boston. Uh, and we worked together as, 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 a, as, a, as a team. Uh, we, 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 we wired these, these little pins and we, 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 we uh, soldered them with plastics. We, we, we made a little, little forms to, to press them together. Uh, and, and so we worked together very, very happily for, well, it might have been, I forget, it must have been four or five months. Margaret, Margaret was, a, was a really fine uh, Scientist and and she she was the first person I ever worked with as as a colleague. She ended up marrying James Keck, another SED, uh, and they they live they've lived they still live up in up in the Boston area. James James Keck Jim Keck, uh, he was he was another fine fellow, and the two of them have have, led a, have married and been married ever since. Okay, that was great. Um, that's, that's us through. Oh, what about, when did you work with George Kesikowski? Oh, so then, um, well, I was still on Jumbo. I couldn't, they didn't let me know anything. But I got my white badge, and shortly thereafter, it couldn't have been more than a week or two, I was told that we were going to have a little meeting with the head of what was called the Explosive Division, of which I was now part of, because Donald Hornig worked for, for, for Kistiakowski, who was the head of the division. So, so Kistiakowski was Hornig's boss. Uh, and so, I, so uh, I, um, uh, I heard that there was a meeting. I was invited to the meeting. And there were like maybe uh, half a dozen uh, SEDs. And, and a couple of civilians, and, and Kistiakowski came to the office. And since I had my white badge, I was cleared. That I was, it was perfectly legitimate to get, to get the information. And he simply told us what we were doing. And that, that was probably three months after I got to Los Alamos, two or three months after. He told us, and that was, that, that was a memorable moment in my life, of course, because he laid out the whole history of the atomic bomb, of the atomic, uh, of, of nuclear fission, and the entire history of the Manhattan Project, and of the entire goal of Los Alamos. Uh, he told it to us. And you have to understand, I know people have, have mixed feelings about the use of the atomic bomb. Many people do not, do not feel very kindly about the use of the atomic bomb. You have to understand where and when this was and where, where I came from. I came from a Jewish family. My, my, my Jewish relatives in Russia were being killed left and right. I knew about that already. Um, the, the, uh, the world in 1944 was was a horrible place. There were there were thousands of thousands of Americans being killed every day. Uh, the only thing we could think of was the war, and to end the war as soon as possible, to end the killing, in both in both Europe and the Far East. When I heard that we were working on something to end the war, it, I couldn't have it couldn't. It was really hard to describe how I felt. How happy, 
and thrilled and honored I was to be working on something that would end the war. And I knew it would end the war. And we all knew it would end the war if it worked. But the way history works, history never, never follows your script. So sure enough, the war in Europe ended before the atomic bomb was actually implemented. But it was not, but it did play a role in the ending of the war in Japan. Can you um, just um, give the name George, start with George Kostikowski and describe him and what he was like? So George Kostikowski came in. You have to understand that I have a Russian background. So here this guy comes out. I think he was bald, you know, a thin, aesthetic looking man. And he started speaking with a heavy Russian accent. <laughs> I said, my God, what was he doing here? But little did I know that he was a professor of chemistry at Harvard University. And, and uh, he was so honest and, and so giving uh, that it's hard, it's hard to describe. He, was, he just simply laid it out. I don't know whether he was authorized to do all that. I mean, we hear all these, these stories about need to know and about everything at Los Alamos was his compartmentalized. That was nonsense. I mean, uh, within three, three months of my getting my, my clearance as, as a, um, a PFC at the time, I believe, in the Army, a private in the Army, I was told this immense secret uh, without any hesitation by, Mr. by, by Professor Kistiakowski. And uh, of course, I could never uh, forget the feeling. But but he was a very interesting guy. Uh, he, he he certainly put it across to to these low low level individuals that he spoke to. So how did um, let's see? I guess you can then why don't you talk about being. Uh, Invited to attend the Tuesday. Uh, yes, so so uh, once I got into the tech area, you have to show your white badge to get it. it would, by today's by today's uh, um, uh, criteria, it wasn't very much. It was just a white badge. Anybody could have made it. Anybody could have made it. Invented the white badge. Anyway, the, I guess people didn't think of uh, that. There's some kind of subtleties those days. I went in, I got into the tech area, guided by MPs guarded by MPs, and, uh, and I immediately found out that there were these Tuesday evening seminars that met in, in the hall within the, within the tech area. And of course, I went to them. Well, why wouldn't I go? Uh, and uh, I, the, the first time when I went to, um, I, there was this, this uh, physicist named Enrico Fermi gave a talk. And I listened to this talk, and here I was just thinking about the atomic bomb. And believe it or not, he didn't talk about the atomic bomb. He talked about the hydrogen bomb. I, I, it was really, really mind-boggling. Here we were. It, was, it must have been in spring of 1944. Or ni yes, yes, 1944. Um, and, and here he was talking about a, a bomb whose predecessor had not yet been built. But the idea of, of, of nuclear fusion was on his mind, and he was thinking ahead. He had already realized that the atomic, that, that uh, nuclear fission was going to work, and it would somehow or other produce an atomic weapon. And then he realized that using the, 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 the uh, uh, fission bombs, you can actually create a temperature high enough to cause, to cause nuclear fusion, cause deuterium to fuse, to form helium, the way the sun does it. So he was thinking about a, a means of producing a controlled and, and non-controlled um, uh, reaction with, with a fusion reaction of, deuteron, of deuterium into, into helium. And this was really 1944. And he was a very interesting, also a very interesting guy. He, he had an Italian accent this time, not a Russian accent, and not a British accent. He had an Italian accent. I told you the international nature of this. The, 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 good fortune of, <coughs> the good fortune of America 
in, in getting these notable scientists away from Hitler and getting them into the United States. Uh, and then we got Enrico Fermi. What a, uh, I mean, Hitler couldn't have been dumber than to let people like, like Fermi go. Not that he would have worked for Hitler. He hated Hitler anyway. Um, and so he, he, he came here with, the, with this Italian accent. And the, the Italians I knew, and I knew plenty of Italians from the Bronx, they all had the same accent. But they weren't physicists. They were storekeepers. So here he was, this, this, this famous physicist, giving this lecture. And it, it, it was quite an experience. And then later on, I, I heard many of the other notables give lectures there, too, including Niels Bohr. <laughs> it was well. To tell you the truth, I, I it was it was uh, I had mixed feeling. It was fun. The 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 uh, the uh, daylight time part was good. The army part I didn't like. I have to admit it. I never I never could. I didn't like sleeping in the same room with fifty or sixty men all snoring, having a, a single bathroom with no booths, uh, just, just a lineup of toilets. Uh, it, it was undignified. Um, let's see. I was going to ask you something about, oh, so could you, um, I mean, everybody's interested in spies. So one of the things you note in your memoirs is that, um, well, David Greenglass was very political, and we used to. He was next door, next bench, next bed next to us, and here he was talking about Russia and how wonderful Russia was, and uh, and all that. And it was really a. He was really was a communist. Quite interesting, and it had even crossed my mind. I have to be to be honestly to honestly say this. And it crossed my mind that there was something wrong with the communists being at this project. Russia was an ally. And the Russian war in Russia was going on uh, very heavily. But it didn't seem right. But I certainly never did anything about it. Uh, it crossed my mind, but I didn't do anything. And it was so bad that eventually uh, Bill Spindell and I got permission to move, to move out. And the green glass and his bunk bunkmate stayed where they were, but we we, we remained sort of uh, uh, friends friendly. But uh, uh, he was a communist, and I don't even think he would deny it if you had asked him. So he felt comfortable talking about his views with you. Yeah, uh, felt comfortable talking about, talking about his views. With yes, you. yes. There was no, never any uh, constraints about that. We never talked about work, except although I, I noticed that um, I did read the testimony during the trial, during the Green, Green Glass trial. I did read the testimony, and he did mention my name in the trial. And he said that he had once asked me innocently uh, what he was machining parts. He was actually machining the, the parts for the bomb. The same, the, the, the uh, uh, lens, he was, he was machining lens uh, molds. And he asked me, he, he said, he says he asked me what they were for. And he said that I said something about a, uh, a bomb, but I don't think, I don't remember that. He does make that claim. He did get me into a heap of trouble because he he he, he said that I he, I was a friend of his, and they called the FBI. Actually called me in, and we had a couple of sessions, and it all worked out fine. Uh, the FBI, despite what you may hear about it, they were very fair. They they listened. They asked hard questions, and uh, it turned out that I was an innocent victim, just as many other people were of, of his friendship. Mm. Wow. Uh, let's see. OK, tell, tell me about Ted Hall. Yes, now Ted Hall was another one, <laughs> another SED. He was a very young one, right? 19? Uh, 
uh, for some reason or other, I met Ted Hall. And he got interested in me because uh, my friend Normie Greenspan and I loved Gustav Mahler. We still do. I just, I just heard the Philharmonic only last week play Mahler's Second Symphony. Um, and um, we had, Greenglass, who was an electronics expert, had constructed a, um, an amplifier using, you should forgive me, parts from the electronic storeroom at Los Alamos. He built an, an amplifier, and it was a really good amplifier. And we had a speaker somewhere, and we put it, we, we uh, uh, placed it in, in Richard Melman's uh, office. He had an office because he was a theorist. We experimentalists didn't have, didn't have offices, but he had an office because he was a theorist. We 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 had the the uh, uh, amplifier, the loudspeaker, and the the uh, uh, a, a record player set up in Richard Bellman's office. And um, Norman Greenspan and I decided to form a society where we could listen to classical music. We called it the Mushroom Society because it could only meet at night when there was nobody there. And we would play music very loud, uh, Baller and Beethoven, Wagner, and uh, all, of, all of the classics, very late at night and, and really enjoying it. And, and uh, Ted Hall heard about it, I guess. He invited himself to become a member. So we, we, um, we were glad to, to have him as a member, and he would come to hear the, um, to, to hear the classical music, and, and he became a member of the Mushroom Society. That's how I knew Ted Hall. I didn't know him outside of the Mushroom Society, and we didn't really talk much because he was, he was a very uh, taciturn person, never really spoke much at all. We also invited Phil Moon and his wife to our concerts. And that was quite interesting. The room couldn't have been more than, than seven feet square. <laughs> and, and, the, and the three of us, plus the Mr. And, uh, Professor and Mrs. Moon, listening to, I uh, forget what we were listening to. But it was quite an experience, a little embarrassing. But nevertheless, it was great. That's great. Um, let's see, Klaus Fuchs, did you know him? Did you know Klaus Fuchs? No, Klaus Fuchs I did not know. <laughs> I know too. No, yeah. <laughs> that we know. That's enough, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. Okay. Um, actually, one thing I thought was very charming uh, was when um, you forgot to remove the shutter. <laughs> yes. Corning. Yes. Oh, yeah. We had the final, the final test. Um, when when these these, these uh, mock-up switches um, were were going to be um, um, oh no 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 I'm sorry they were not the switch the mock-up they were the real switches the real switches had arrived and uh, they were a little kind kind of bulky but the, and and. Uh, uh, they were nothing like the little pins we were using, but they were already they were they were professionally manufactured, and we had them lined up, and and uh, uh, Donald Hornig was there because it was a very important test. We lined them up. Uh, it took me uh, it took me probably five hours to to wire everything up properly, and um, it was probably three o'clock in the morning when when the thing went off. And uh, I threw the switch, the thing went off. And John, Don Hornick said to me, wouldn't it be funny if you forgot to remove the shutter? There was a, it, it very much like any, any uh, big camera, it had a shutter in front, of the, in front of the film, only the shutter was five feet long too, and you had to pull it all the way out. And he said, wouldn't it be funny if you had forgot to remove the shutter? And at that point, I realized I had forgotten to remove the shutter. So I uh, uh, almost, almost uh, crawled away. And I told him that I forgot to remove the shutter. And he laughed, because I'm sure it, it does happen to everybody. And he was very reassuring and said, well, we'll do it over again. And so we did it again the next night. Uh, 
And I'll always have a very sore spot in my heart for Don Hornig for having not killed me, for having <laughs> ruined, the, ruined the first experiment. But it, it turned out OK only, only a day later. Very nice. I know. I know his uh, son. His oh, you do? Uh, yes. Oh, really? Yeah, they just went up to see him um, last weekend. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They are still alive. Lily. Is. Lily is Lily his wife. Is, yeah. Lily is two, and she's sharp as a tack. But Don has got Alzheimer's, so. Don has Alzheimer's. He's not. I don't know what stage, uh, but that's a, a problem. Yeah. So, oh, that's amazing. Yes. Yeah, so, no, well, I, I just yeah. want to share that with them. Yeah. <laughs> To yes. do. I may, I may go up there. To, I've been meaning to for years, and of course. Can you imagine laughing after? I'm not sure I would have done it. If a graduate student of mine did that, I'm not sure I would have been so, so uh, forgiving. Marvelous. Um, now let's go to um, Wendover. Tell us about uh, Wendover, the role of the 509th, and what it was like when you went there. Yeah, uh, Wendover, of course, was was the um, the staging airfield for the 509th Bombardment Squadron uh, that was to drop the bomb. Um, a, a, f a few of the uh, uh, people from Los Alamos were were told to work with the bomb crews to show them how to throw the switches and how to, in general to uh, prepare to, to drop, to, to trigger the bomb. The bomb I mean, you can be sure the top bomb was not, was not armed while, it was, uh, while they were not over a target. They had to arm it. Uh, I was one of the people who, who was chosen to um, uh, Instruct them on how to and how to throw the switches and arm it, uh, and I mean, I was only a, a PFC or a corporal or something of that sort at the time, and these were all lieutenants and. Wait for the phone to stop ringing. Unfortunately. Huh. Oh. Yeah. Um, Okay. I guess that's it. Okay. Uh, I was one of those who, who were chosen to go there, um, and th they were all captains, lieutenants, captains, and more and majors, and I was, a, and I was supposed to instruct them. Now you know the the army is a very hierarchical organization, and you cannot have a, a, a PFC or a corporal instructing a captain on how to do anything. So. They, they realized that would, would never do. So f some genius decided to make me a civilian uh, artificially. So uh, they gave me $200. That was, that was an experience in itself. They said, go to Santa Fe and buy yourself some civilian clothes. So I went to Santa Fe. And sure enough, I bought some civilian clothes. I bought a sharp jacket, some pants. Uh, and uh, shirts and ties. I brought them back to the barracks, and I wore them. And everybody was really thrilled to watch me. They were, they were, they were making, everybody was making enormous jokes. But I could not buy shoes because, because shoes were rationed. I only had army shoes, which, 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 are, which are inside out. So you see the rough parts of the shoe, and they go up to, to the ankle. So, so I needed a. Um, a shoe ration certificate. So I actually had to go to the go to the security officer, um, and um, uh, explain to him. And, and I had to get a note from from my commanding officer, who, by the way, the, my commanding officer uh, didn't know anything about the atomic bomb. So they were they were all. It, there was always a certain tension among the SEDs and the atomic bomb because we knew, and our bosses didn't know what we were doing, and we felt very important, and we were probably pretty, pretty uh, smarky about it, and uh, they didn't like uh, care for our attitude too much, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, I got I got written permission, which I have in my in my records here. I do have some records. I got written permission to. Uh, uh, as, as, Probably the only 
secret document in the army which permits a person to buy a pair of shoes. So, so I got permission and I, and I bought a pair of civilian shoes. Uh, that, and uh, then, then uh, I, I, I masqueraded as a civilian in, in my periodic trips to Wendover. I would, we would go to, uh, to uh, Albuquerque, take a flight to Wendover, uh, fly over the desert, land in Wendover. There I would stay in a motel as a civilian in a motel. That was really a luxury, uh, a private room. and. Um, uh, so I would work with them during the daytime, and at night, the, that 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 was right right near Nevada. I would gamble at night uh, in the in the gambling casinos, having a ball, playing uh, blackjack, and then fly back and be, <laughs> change out of my civilian in, into a lonely GI, and I would become a GI for a while. Then the next the next time I would go. Uh, uh, as a, as a civilian. So it was really a schizophrenic life I was leading for a while there. Can you describe your civilian jacket? There was something in there. Oh, well, I, it was a very sharp jacket. I thought about that for a long time, and I said, this is my only time chance I'm ever going to have to have a, to have a sharp. I'm not going to buy a conservative tweed jacket. So I bought a, a, a uh, now I'm st I can't remember to this day whether it was blue or green. I think it was green, but it may have been um, red or green. Red or green, I think it was green. It may have been red, but it was a very sharp jacket. And that's what caused hilarity in the barracks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I realized that there was no, no reason why I couldn't do it. Nobody, nobody could stop me. <laughs> so that was my way of, of uh, of showing, showing my independence from the army. <laughs> That's great. Okay, let's see. Um, so then, then should we go to taking the uh, Green Hornet? Yeah. Then, so then, uh, it was clear that we were uh, uh, getting ready now. Now I forget. I think that must have been probably June. Uh, you probably know better than I do. May, early, late May or early June, before, be, uh, before Trinity, before Amagoro, uh, Amagoro in July, right? July twelfth, if I'm not mistaken, thirteenth, sixteenth, sixteenth. Um, and um, so I was given orders to go to Tinian. For the for the very to, to go to the to the assembly place where the bomb was being assembled, for the very reason that I knew how to how, how to um, to wire the uh, the switches, and so I um, along with with uh, uh, a few dozen others altogether probably uh, forty or fifty uh, took this uh, military plane. It was a uh, uh, not a, a very comfortable plane, uh, very much like like most military passenger planes, called the Green Hornet. The Green Hornet flew flew me plus um, um, uh, a uh, another plus a civilian, Ed Stevenson, who is a professor at the University of Virginia, and a few others. Uh, we flew to. Um, uh, L.A. and then to Hawaii. We stayed in Hawaii overnight, and then flew to Johnson Island, and then finally to Guam, and then finally from Guam to Tinian. The Guam and Tinian are a Mariana, are a part of the Mariana group of islands, which were were actually Japanese protectorates and were captured uh, not very sh sh soon before then by the Americans. A few months earlier, and Tinian was converted into this into the airfield, which which for a while was the was the largest airfield in the world. It was there were hundreds of bombers, B twenty nine, B twenty nines, shuttling back and forth to Japan from there, and that's where we set up shop. We set up shop in a Quonset hut. We had a we had a. A, a living Quonset hut and a, a laboratory, a working Quonset hut. So civilians had another Quonset hut. The thing I loved about being overseas uh, 
was that once you got away from from uh, in the U.S., uh, the this uh, artificial barrier between officers and enlisted men and civilians was completely gone. Civilians and officers were living exactly the way we were. That made me feel much better. <laughs> I never really liked the idea that, that officers had better quarters than I did. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, the books that you sent ahead so you can have something to You know, I forgot. Oh. You can't get up. You can't get up. I can't, oh, I'm not going to get up. I mean, you can't get up. So there's a, like there's a, 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 a loose leaf notebook there on my desk. Blue one? Oh, loose leaf. It says army on it. Okay. I shouldn't. This is my this is my various materials which you want to probably want to look at later. Here is here is the book my pocket book of verse. Can you see that? This is the cover. From the from the pocketbook of verse which I carried with me everywhere, I had I was standing online many much much of my, t my my daylight hours, as everybody else did standing online, and I would read read poems from what, one poem to the next for months at a time. And I, I uh, learned to love some of these poems. This is the cover. It it broke up. The cover, the original cover broke up. Uh, early on, and I made an artificial cover, and it says the pocketbook of verse, uh, or whiling away the the idle hours on Tinian. Uh, General Groves decided it was time to meet some of the GIs. But you know, he in his 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 uh, autobiography, he never even mentions the SED. SED. Uh, we were invisible to some, to, to many of these, of the big brass. Um, any, but anyway, he decided that it was time that he met some. So he called a few of us together. It was probably early December of uh, 1945, and um, um, uh, uh, 1944, and and. Uh, he, he, he said to, he gave us a lecture, but the lecture had nothing to do with atomic bombs. It was a lecture telling us to uh, write home to our parents on Christmas because they needed, they need to hear from us because they were very worried about us. So please write home to your parents. And interestingly enough, in looking at some of the information that I saw on Cindy Kelly's um, website, American, the, the Atomic Heritage Foundation, I saw a, uh, some sort of a note from somebody at Oak Ridge. And he said, he talked about having met General Groves. And um, he, he mentioned that General Groves had told him to be sure to write home to his parents. So I realized that General Groves going around all of the Manhattan Project sites telling all of the SEDs to write home of his parents. That's, so that was my, my interaction with General Groves. He, he, uh, uh, since I was a good boy, uh, I wrote home to my parents anyway. I didn't need him to tell me that. One of these uh, true ironies of history, uh, who could have ever imagined this? That the island of Tinian was laid out something like the Isle of Manhattan. Uh, the, the soldiers who, who the, the uh, CBs or whoever did, who, lined, who made the, the airfield, uh, and there was a, sort of a flat island, uh, roughly looking a bit something like Manhattan. So they laid it out uh, with the streets, with these streets and avenues like 42nd Street, 5th Avenue, uh, uh, Broadway, Ninth Avenue, so so Tinian was laid out like Manhattan. So to, to, think, to think of this as as the culmination of the Manhattan Project was something that nobody could ever have invented. It just happened by pure chance. Uh, who would believe it? <laughs> Unless there's some guiding light up there that's really that really is telling us what to do. It makes you think about that. <laughs> Who laid it out had no idea. No, no, that was long before the, the uh, we ever got there. The, this uh, Quonset hut, 
They, I remember I said we had two resident quasinauts, two where we lived. Then we had a laboratory quasinaut, which was air conditioned, of course. It was a much fancier laid out than, than our living quarters. Um, uh, it had a dark room, so so because it was necessary to to to, uh, to test this, to to use the Shriek camera, which I should have mentioned, of course, was shipped over too. The Shriek camera that we used at, at Los Alamos was shipped over to test the switches, the real switches. Um, so uh, uh, I. Um, was was in the Quonset hut when it was told that Curtis LeMay was going to come to give us a visit, but uh, I was dressed um, in my usual Tinian way. It was a very it's a very warm, humid climate. I had my army shoes on, my boots, and a pair of shorts, and that's all. I didn't have a shirt, so uh, the uh, these the. the uh, People in charge there said that, that, that will not do, because Curtis LeMay, he's a he's a big shot general. He wouldn't like to see a GI dressed like you are. So they they said, what are we going to do? So it was too it was too late to bring bring me back to the uh, to the to my barracks to make Quonset. So they shoved me into the dark room, closed the door, turned on the red light, which would inhibit him from coming in, and they locked me in. I stayed there for about half an hour, and, and uh, they finally knocked on my door and said, it's OK, now he's gone. I went out, and uh, they were all buzzing, saying uh, what a funny visit it was, because they t kept telling Curtis LeMay how important the bomb was, and he simply was very skeptical about the whole thing. Because you know he had been sending hundreds of these incendiary missions uh, over Tokyo and other cities. Uh, he'd been doing it day in, day out for months. And to say, to think that one bomb, one plane, could do the work of his entire force was just too much for him to, to take. He just didn't believe it. But later on, he, he realized how important it was. And when he became the head of the Strategic, strategic Air Command, uh, he, he even uh, didn't, didn't particularly uh, uh, take that use of atom bombs uh, off the table for for use in a, in a possible Cold War, so he was much of a very much of a hawk uh, all all of his life. Right, where were you, and how did you learn about the dropping the bomb? Well, the night before, which was August fifth, we knew the bomb was going to be dropped that night. That they were going to take off that evening. Uh, so we said, now, I, I wasn't invited to see the takeoff. I, I didn't ask to see the takeoff. Uh, I, don't, uh, I think by then I was beginning to feel a little funny about it. I, I, I just sat, I, we just stayed in our barracks and we talked. Uh, the Navy photographers were there. The, there were photographers who were, taking, who were, were told to take the t pictures of the takeoff, and there was William Lawrence. He was the distinguished uh, New York Times science writer. He was there, and he was interviewing us about it. And so we we sort of we we knew uh, that that the secrecy was about to be lost. So we were a little more open than usual, talking, hinting about how important it was, but we couldn't, of course, say exactly what it was. Uh, we we talked and. Uh, sort of, sort of, uh, in circles a little bit uh, about what was going to happen. I went to bed. Must have been about one o'clock, twelve, one o'clock. I woke up the next morning, and we have a radio. I turned on the radio, and that's when I heard about the bomb, because it had already been dropped. The announcers were already announcing it, and uh, uh, Los Alamos was already being being spoken about. So the secret was out. Uh, everything was, was done. The, uh, Nagasaki was devastated, destroyed. Uh, the world had changed while I, while I slept that night on a Quonset Dantinian. The world, I knew it was going to change, and sure enough, it changed. And of course, I forgot to mention that I kept a diary of all this most of the time I was there, because we all knew how important it was all along. 
Ted, you have your diary? Yes, it's right there. Fantastic. I bought this stenographic notebook, and I, um, um, I, I started writing in it the day I took off from, uh, from Los Alamos. And then, uh, let's see if I can find August, August 5th. I'll just read the first paragraph of August 5th. That I, I was sitting in my barracks that evening, and I'll just read what I said here. There are 18 canvas cots in our Quonset hut. Two of them are being temporarily occupied by Navy photographers who have just flown from Guam to film our setup and the takeoff. The other 16 supply the sleeping facilities for the entire enlisted men a membership of the f first technical service detachment. That's what it calls. And most of the fellows are gathered in one corner of the hut, and these, um, and there's much excited talk. Uh, the Navy men are completely confused uh, by the uh, by the hints and and the wild speculations. So I I go on and on and on about that. Let's see. Um, then, see if I can find August 6th, and then I, I spend a lot of time about that. I talk about my job, about my ignition uh, expert, the, the X unit, the, the, I talk about the X unit. Then, after I got back to Los Alamos, I read. I reread this, and I said, "My God, what have I said?" I I realized that I might have said something that really I shouldn't have said in my diary. So <laughs> I was a smoker at the time. And you know, I was, a, I was a two pack a day smoker. Isn't that amazing? So what I did was, I <laughs> I destroyed the evidence. <laughs> I, I just to make sure I just got I, the thing I said about the X well, the X unit I destroyed. I tried to make it look like an accident, but I don't think it was. Um, oh wait a minute, yeah, this. Uh, Oh no! So then, my next my next uh, t entry was August tenth. The the, the the days that followed, <coughs> we were so excited that I didn't write. I don't think I wrote that for three for three and a half days afterwards. And then I finally wrote, and then I said, and then I then on August tenth, I said today. There are farmers in Wisconsin talking about atomic bombs over the dinner table. There must be countless street corner uh, arguments about the atomic bombs in every city in the country. People throughout the world must be feeling their soberest, matching their elation over this new spectacular turn of the war with a tempering knowledge that this thing is bigger. Shall I wait? Yeah, it's very good. Sure. That's the fair, that it's very hard to yeah. get, it, get rid of that once it's on the tape. I'll start again. Okay. Today, there are farmers in Wisconsin talking about atomic bombs over the dinner table. There must be countless street corner arguments about atomic bombs in every city in the country. People throughout the world must be feeling their soberest, matching their elation over this new spectacular turn of the war with the tempering knowledge that this thing is bigger than it appears and that though it will help end this war uh, soonest, it might, well, it might very well mean other and more important things too. Uh, a few days ago, the, the best kept secret of the war, it is now being more talked about and written about than even I thought it would be. It's, it's funny that all along I knew what this weapon meant, that here is no overestimate, that there is no overestimating its importance. Yet I know that the news is out, that 
that the news is out, and I'm st I'm still in, amazed by the treatment it's is getting. Though I know it's destructive powers, I was still awe-stricken by the after photographs of Hiroshima. Oh, I said Nagasaki before. I meant Hiroshima, the first bomb. Yes, it was not Nagasaki. That was a mistake. So that, is that enough? No, that's great. You want more? Uh, with the ga with the gadget, there was no possibility of an anticlimax. We've argued about its effect and its importance, but the day after we dropped the first one, I divided any, my predicted duration of the war, which was one year originally, by two. I divided the quotient by two again the next day when Russia entered the war, and even that may be due to some extent to the gadget. That's what we call the atomic bomb. Uh, so now I say three months, and I'm a pessimist about these things. Uh, uh, we're now we're listening to the hourly news broadcasts and having a fine time separating the truth from the bunk. This was the one where some f foul publicity searcher named Jacobson, who more none of us had heard of, claimed a, a bomb area should remain uninhabitable for at least 70 years. He said, that's not true. The days of that is, is a half-truth and consequently difficult to deny. OK, that's, that's enough of that. Then uh, I spent a lot of time in my diary after that writing about the consequence. I don't think you want to read about my pontificating about an inter international control. That was, I was thinking about how to control the bomb. And I thought about, and I said, there's no other way. It has to be international. Because sooner or later, somebody else is going to get the bomb. And now what are you going to do? Then there'll be two countries with the bomb. Then there might be four countries with the bomb. And, and, and there's no end to it. How can you live with a with world filled with atomic weapons? It's got to be under international control. I said, that's the only way you can have. And then at the end of my, of my pontificating about this, I said, and then I'm probably all wet. <laughs> and I was right. I, mean, I was all wet. It's not, the bomb has proliferated, it's, and it's not under international control. And who knows if it ever will be? One doesn't know. It's still with us, and it's, it's a bigger threat than ever. When the, when the, when the, it was it August 10th or 11th that the war ended? 14th. When, 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 the, when the armistice when the armistice was announced. The, was it the 14th? Uh, the night of that night, I got so excited. I, I said, I got to tell somebody. <laughs> I'd heard about it. Of course, I was listening to the radio. And I went over to the uh, officer's tent, which was exactly the same as ours. And there was Ed Stevenson asleep. And I shook him. <laughs> woke him. I said, wake up. The war's over. And the the interesting part of that is that that was an expression <clears throat> that in the Bronx we used all the time, especially when we were playing handball or we were playing stickball or whatever we were doing, and somebody would be half asleep. We'd say, wake up, the war's over. And I said, in my life, I'm going to be able to use this expression once, and it will really mean the war's over. And so I woke up Ed Stevenson, and I said, wake up, the war's over. And that, and that was that. That was a culmination of a long dream of mine. What was his reaction? And he was he was he was sort of drowsy. <laughs> I think he, it took him a while to uh, realize what had happened. And then, of course, the, the aftermath. For many years at NYU, I taught a course called Physics and Society. Uh, it was probably an outgrowth of my of my experiences at Los Alamos and elsewhere. And it, it addressed science-related societal issues. And of course, one of the most important of the science-related societal issues was the atomic bomb. And I would spend a part of the course talking about the atomic bomb. And the students will always raise the question of, of did, what did Truman 
make a mistake in dropping the atomic bomb. Many students then and now think that it was a mistake to drop the bomb. Many people think it was a mistake to drop the bomb. I did not think it was a mistake. And I look at the students, usually I would look at the students in the class, all young, young people, 19, 20, 21 years old, and I said, you know, many of your parents would have been killed if there had been an invasion of Japan, and there would have been an invasion of Japan if the Japanese had not surrendered. And you would not, have, you would not be here. Of course, there's no way of knowing that, but you have to realize that dropping the bomb saved lives, saved American lives. It killed a lot of people, and you could never you can never uh, understand the horror of that. There's no doubt about that. But war is horrible. And the war was going on. And people were getting killed all the time. And the Americans were getting killed. And I guess the first thought was to save American lives. It may have saved Japanese lives, too. Who can tell how many, how many Ameri Japanese lives would have, lost, would have been lost had there been an invasion of Japan? Probably a lot. Um, so I think that was an argument that was very telling, and the students, many of the students, understood that. It's a very, it was a tough decision, but Truman made the right decision. Not many years after the atomic bomb was what was dropped, and many, and, uh, and a few years after, there was a lot of testing of atomic weapons, and uh, the Russians had succeeded in developing an atomic bomb. The hydrogen bomb was successfully developed. The hydrogen bomb has a, has a, a destructive power many, many times larger than the, than the atomic bomb. And now the world is filled with, with, with uh, hydrogen bombs in, in the, in the um, Russian arsenal, the American arsenal, and who knows what other arsenals. The, the hydrogen bomb, if dropped in Manhattan, would destroy the entire city, would destroy the entire uh, island. And that means that two or three million people would have been killed, and the entire culture of, of America would have been destroyed. Uh, it's unthinkable. And yet it could happen. I still think that what I wrote here is still true. The only way to solve this problem is to have an international uh, control of atomic weapons and then their destruction. At some, day, at some point in the, in the distant future, if, if we still exist, the world will come to its senses will form a, a true, truly well-policed, organized uh, organization, part of the United Nations, hopefully, and atomic weapons will be destroyed. That's a, I doubt if I'll live to see it, but maybe, maybe people in the audience will live to see it. It's worth looking forward to. And if it happens, it, it will save, it, it, it won't happen for a long time, but it, it might happen.